Sysdig is the first cloud-native visibility and security platform that eliminates the need for standalone tools like container security and monitoring. Using Sysdig's unique data approach, enterprises can solve a variety of visibility and security issues at massive enterprise scale for multi- and hybrid cloud environments. Sysdig will enable your organization to scan and block vulnerable images and enforce best practices pre-production, block threats, enforce compliance, and monitor application performance, proactively alert on incidents, reduce MTTR with forensics, and capture detailed audit records. All from a single, unified platform. Accelerate your transition to containers and then have confidence in your ongoing operations using Sysdig. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Sysdig. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by Matt Alderman. Some of you told us that you are overwhelmed by the amount of content we distribute. In an attempt to make it a little easier for you to find what you're interested in, we've created our new listener interest list. Sign up for the list and select your interests by visiting securityweekly.com slash subscribe and clicking the button to join the list. You can also now submit your suggestions for guests in our recently released guest suggestion form. Go to securityweekly.com slash guests and enter your suggestions. Security Weekly will be at Hacker Halted in Atlanta, Georgia this October 10th through 11th. EC Council is offering our listeners a 15% discount to sit for any of their bootcamp courses or workshops. Visit securityweekly.com slash hacker halted to register now. Matt, there's been, uh, I guess it's been about three weeks since we've seen you, and uh, there's been a lot of security news that has just happened in this only in the last one week. A lot of it about phones. Also, I wanted just to start off some more wormification of this uh, RDP vulnerability called BlueKeep. So mostly I wanted to highlight this so I could make the Pink Floyd reference that we're basically waiting for the worms to come, because even uh, NSA has come out and said, please patch your systems. And um, you know, one of the aspects here is RDP is a default remote access capability for your cloud services. Um, it, either it's usually either RDP for Windows or SSH for your you know Linux-based systems. Um, but this was also when we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. You know, Microsoft even put out a patch for Windows XP. So for as much as we are going to keep focusing on DevOps, DevSecOps, you know, modern application security, there's still a lot of scary tech debt out there that just means millions of systems are potentially able to be compromised by something like this that could be a worm. Yeah, we, and we see this also with the, the next story on the email side as well is, you know, some of these legacy systems that have vulnerabilities have huge potential impact uh, to organizations, not only at the system level, but even at the application level. Yeah, so that um, XM, the, the mail transfer agent, so um, basically what helps our email get, get around the internet, um, had a cool vulnerability that was identified that was specifically a remote command execution, meaning it was able to execute commands um, through basically what was a parsing error in um, addresses. So I wanted to highlight this for a couple of reasons. One, Exum is pretty ancient technology just in the sense that it's been around since the dawn of the internet. You know, there's Exum, there's Bind, a couple of these core types of services that really drive the internet. And, and this also hasn't even really had a problem of security in a long time. It's, it's not notorious for always having a critical update or always having vulnerabilities and so on. But just a good reminder that parsing is hard. And anytime you're parsing data, make sure you're you know doing that classic separation of code from data so that you know attacker influenced data can't actually turn into a pipe into a command shell or be dropped into, in this case, an exec VE and then just be the next bin SH and um, to throw other fancy language that sounds fancy, but is actually pretty straightforward types of uh, remote attacks. Another thing that was um, probably is always going to be around for us is adware. Now in this case, came across a lookout, found a, one particular adware that stood out because of its, um, was doing a lot of work to obfuscate itself. And I think in, it, it had hit around half a million installations from the uh, Google Play Store. 
Yeah, I mean, this this goes back to the com part of the conversation we just had on this software supply chain, right? Looking for what's embedded in my code, right? Here you have this this piece of adware embedded in these applications with, like you said, almost you know a half a million download or five hundred million downloads, um, and serving up you know ads and in, in, in the environment and people didn't know it was there I, again going back and kind of doing your composition analysis what's in my code base you know this is a this is a big one right here yeah absolutely and there's that aspect of that composition analysis and how you know how does like that software bill of materials kind of fit into here because it's not necessarily trying to address that malicious actor it's you know that bill of materials is trying to address hey here's some vulnerabilities in third-party software uh, that you should know about and go fix it. But um, so it still is going to be an attack vector to keep an eye on and figure out what can we do to uh, find it, tap it down, and uh, get rid of it quickly rather than later. Yep. There's another really cool one that um, just stood out for me from the perspective of a, a creative threat model and threat scenarios. So um, there was this tap ghost um, uh, vulnerability uh, or sort of like an attack uh, developed by a couple of researchers out of Japan. And they were basically showing what could be considered a, um, a sort of the Android version of clickjacking in a way, or a UI redress, or what's called that confused deputy attack, where essentially they're using NFC to trigger an interaction with your device. So here your device, Android, goes to a link, and rather than says, you know, when, once it prompts a user to interact and say, do you want to go here, yes or no, it's going to actually throw in some jitter onto the capacitive touchscreen. So rather than your finger landing on the yes or no that you're expecting it to be, this um, uh, the, the attack mechanism, which does actually have to be very close in proximity because it's taking advantage of NFC and it's basically generating a lot of errors within that capacitive touchscreen. So rather than the human tapping, um, uh, one one part, you know, one particular button, the attack creates a ghost touch that taps the other one that could lead into some other type of, you know, vulnerability chaining, download malware, et cetera, et cetera. But what was really just neat is that it, it, pull, it, it came more so into that hardware and communications world rather than just being a pure uh, software vulnerability. Um, so, so that was pretty neat to me. And that's the kind of thing that I think show some cool cleverness as for as much as these, um, you know, our devices are starting to talk to each other, which we're going to mention in just a second, via NFC and Bluetooth. And um, we have nice touch screens and capacitive touch. There's a lot of cool electrical engineering that goes into this that doesn't make it so perfect. There's a lot of error and jitter that um, these devices need to deal with. Yeah, and, and what's interesting in this particular article is, you know, they get into a demo and they get into the science about how this actually works. And you're right, it's a lot of electrical engineering principles around how the current in, in, from the finger can be detected and then and ghosted. Um, so it's, it's really interesting when you think about the types of techniques we're using to give us these cool capabilities also have limitations in science and have vulnerabilities from a science perspective or can be spoofed potentially uh, from pure science. Exactly. And that's why my, my only wish here is that they had gone for a name like Phantom Menace or something so we could go into the proper science fiction aspect of this. But um, I will use that as a segue to talk about um, Apple. So they made a bunch of really interesting announcements last week. But one thing that was really interesting, and this goes into the science of cryptography, um, they are Talked, they talked to Wired Magazine about how in their new um, Catalina and iOS 13, they were going to improve that Find My Device. And they were going to do it in a way that everyone's devices are now broadcasting to nearby devices via, via Bluetooth so that they can say, essentially saying, hey, I'm here, hey, I'm here, ad nauseum, so that if your device does get lost, stolen, et cetera, you ha and, it's, and your device has been turned off, you actually have a pretty good idea of where it was last as well as where it pops up again and starts talking to other devices. Now, there's a couple major potential issues here. 
especially for tracking and privacy. So if your Apple device is, you know, always saying, hey, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm over here, and either Apple or even the devices and people around you are tracking that, that's, you know, that, that, that's that creepy factor. That's that ick factor that this isn't really cool. So what Apple has done through, and I'm going to hand wave a little bit here, but through some pretty good end-to-end -end cryptography and some good anonymization, they're essentially saying these device, the devices you own are going to establish a key that only they know, that Apple doesn't know. They're going to use this key to encrypt just a few bits of data that they're going to drop into part of these normal Bluetooth communications that it typically does already. So it's not like it has to, to do any additional um, traffic generation. And it's going to rotate those keys. And that key rotation um, is going to make it possible to say, while I'm walking through the vendor hall at DEF CON, um, sure, you're going to see a couple Bluetooth beacons coming on my phone. But as I go throughout the entire day, those beacons are going to be different and then different again and different again. And you're not going to have, at least from that one particular signal, a good way to correlate those individual encrypted Bluetooth tokens, essentially, to a single individual person or a single device. And to me, that's really, really cool. Yeah, what's really cool about this is by implementing that technique, it, it allows you to find out where your device is but really nobody else, even Apple themselves, because of the rotation of the keys and the secrecy of the private keys uh, in, in the collection of this data, is it can beacon constantly, which is not supposed to impact battery or, or any of the other performance on the device, and give the owner of those devices much better identity of where those devices are without exposing that to everybody else. And I, it, that's a really interesting feature. It is neat. And one of the things, you know, I encourage everyone to read through the article because it's also just a great exercise in threat modeling. Because just think of, sure, we encrypted everything. It's confidential. Awesome. We protected it. Nobody can peek in. But just as you were saying just now, Matt, you know, that threat model of who's actually watching, as well as what if we as the end users, our threat, so to speak, is actually Apple itself, you know, tracking us or using our data to sell to third parties. Because there's a lot of, you know, just as we mentioned that adware um, and malicious adware um, just a few uh, minutes ago, that's where money is. Whether you're, a, uh, whether you're a legit operator collecting user information to sell to advertisers or you're actually just trying to sell fraudulent clicks on ads because that way you can collect revenue in some way. There's money to be made here. Um, so this is a really cool thing to see. Yeah, and it hopefully does, more people yeah. use the feature <laughs> instead of yes. turning it off. Yeah, and that's where um, even a couple, I, I want to say this was four years ago now, um, one of the iOS releases, they introduced app transport security, which basically said the device is going to automatically promote every single web request in from HTTP into HTTPS. But a lot of people balked and said, well, we don't actually have all of our own services set up to be HTTPS only. So there's a couple issues there. Um, supposedly, there was an article that came out relatively recently about this, saying just a lot of you know ad servers and the ad ecosystem didn't have a lot of their own services set up for uh, to handle HTTPS. So essentially, there were you know developers were being told by um, Apple say, hey, there's this great service. It's going to encrypt everything by default. And then all of these other you know, third-party tools and other third-party services were saying, yeah, please don't use that. It doesn't work with our stuff. So um, there's a little bit of a give and take here in the sense of just hoping developers actually focus on HTTP everywhere, get those Let's Encrypt certificates, and um, start using something like HSTS to, to also help enforce those, um, those connections. What's in, but, this is yeah. part of the reason why I asked the, the question to Tanya in the last segment was mm -hmm. by default, right? This is a feature that's there by default. Apple made this feature available four, four plus years ago, something like that. And two thirds of developers are turning it off. They're actively turning it off um, it, for, for obvious reasons, you know, some of the other systems that they're using don't support it. But here's a great case where you can provide better security in iOS itself 
by leaving this default feature on and two thirds of users are turning it off. Now, Apple at one time, I think at the end of 2016 or yeah, I think it was around the end of 2016, they were gonna force this as, there was no way to turn it off. Now they backed off of that um, before it went live, I guess in 2017. But this is a really good example of <laughs> the, the, the silly things we do sometimes from an application development perspective to protect our applications. This is a really good capability that <laughs> we're turning off because our ad server or this or that, it doesn't support HTTPS. Yeah, and it's one of those things that it, it, it used to be the case. I used to be more, a little bit more forgiving that, yeah, deploying HTTPS is pretty complicated. But if you're going into a cloud environment, you can use Let's Encrypt. There are so many tools, whether free or commercial, just to help with deploying certs, managing certs, checking the rotation, which is the one thing that everybody gets tripped up on. But yeah, this is one of those things. It's a little bit harder to build too much sympathy for developers to actually be turning off you know, a secure default. And we've seen, you know, Apple isn't even the only one trying to push forward on these things. We saw Chrome and SHA-1 certificates saying Chrome coming out and saying, you know what, we're actually going to deprecate these certificates and we're going to mark them as not trusted. And then we're going to start to mark certain um, TLS ciphers, you know, not trusted. And then we're actually going to be a lot more vocal in our browser about the, you know, how well deployed this HTTPS endpoint is for this web application. And let alone, here's where you start to hit the money. Um, we may even demote your page ranking based on whether you have HTTP or HTTPS. And that's the one thing to like, go, out, go after the money and that can be a motivator for developers. Yeah, exactly. And so speaking of motivating developers, um, on a more positive aspect, it looks like um, Red Hat has a OpenShift 4, and that's got to be a good thing for um, everyone in, you know, within that type of ecosystem, right? Yeah, I mean, so at KubeCon a few weeks back when I was over there in Barcelona, we actually had Red Hat on one of the panels and, and we talked a little bit about pieces of this. Version 4 is now um, released. Here's what's interesting to me. Uh, two of the components in this announcement are actually part of the CoreOS acquisition, right? Um, which was a really interesting acquisition at the time that it happened. As you were watching the whole container platform ecosystem play out, you really had kind of three major players. You had obviously Docker, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, and, and, Mesos, and, and Mesosphere and, and the Marathon guys, right? And from an enterprise perspective, you know, Red Hat was really winning a lot of the container platform um, environment they were they were winning i mean they were doing better than docker uh in, in the the adoption of of openshift and they go out and they buy core os and they buy core os i think more for kubernetes but core os had a lot of other stuff in it right it had claire which was uh the static analysis uh software composition tool which was open source they had the, the core os the the container os and they had a bunch of kubernetes capabilities so here Really great from a security perspective. Red Hat buys Core OS. Now what you're seeing is the results of that acquisition. You have Kubernetes operators. You have the Linux Core OS capabilities now supported natively in OpenShift 4, which means a lot of the integration components from that acquisition have made its way into enterprise OpenShift. And I think that's great for anybody leveraging this platform. Yeah, just, yeah, all those integrations, it's, it's basically saying it kind of ties in that that ongoing theme we have here of saying you don't just do devops by doing one aspect like just taking your legacy web app putting it into like a container and then throwing it out on the cloud didn't really make you you know cloud native or that didn't really make you devopsy um to coin the word so this is right. definitely that kind of aspect that, that makes it get there yeah, and I think you're going to continue to see these container platforms continue to add more capabilities. Because if I think about the best place to integrate security in my new container application, I think the container platform vendors themselves are in a really good position if they embrace it to bring it in and make it really easy for the developers not only to develop and deploy applications from a containerization perspective, but also potentially 
integrate security components in as part of those build processes and just make more secure code as part of those overall platforms. And I think that's the potential opportunity that Red Hat, Docker um, have. Docker hasn't done it really to, to much extent. I mean, they announced it at DockerCon a year ago, but you really haven't seen much. Here you're starting to see Red Hat moving some of these capabilities from the CoreOS acquisition into the platform, which I think is good. That is good. And that I think helps us also, especially when you're calling attention to those security aspects and bringing those security tools into that development and that deployment orchestration system, that that's was highlighted in that other article we've got here that um, talking about, you know, are we doing DevOps or DevSecOps as well? Or what does that mean to throw in that security angle for it? And real quick, I think the, the the line that made me love this article, there's one line near the end that it actually, when it's talking about the DevOps lifecycle, it talks about planning, coding, pre-production, and it throws in that phrase, and even decommissioning. Because that decommissioning, where you call it like, we have short-lived immutable, immutable systems that just get thrown away on a weekly basis, or we just have a service that's been around for a month, or sorry, for maybe even like a year, but we're going to replace it with something new and fresh. That, a lot of the cloud, I love the aspects of getting rid of or minimizing mm -hmm. tech debt. And that to me is just a huge, you know, unspoken aspect or implied aspect of where security comes into this whole process. Yeah, and the reason I pulled this article in is, is we actually talked about this on the last segment with Tanya again is DevOps capabilities. Everybody's at a different level of maturity. You know, she talked a lot about people say they're doing DevOps, but they're, they're not really full DevOps compared to how ready are we for what people think is next, which is DevSecOps, right? And there's still a gap in, there's a disconnect between what DevOps from a development perspective is actually doing versus can we truly get to a DevSecOps? It's this whole concept of shifting left from a security perspective, getting it embedded earlier into the design and development process where we can integrate security into the pipeline, secure our applications better from the, the get-go. And this article talks about, look, there, there's still a big divide here. And so we can talk about DevOps, we can talk about DevSecOps, but, but there's still a gap here that has to be resolved and I, I put it on some of us from a security perspective, security vendors, and being willing and, and working closely with how do we integrate security tools into the developer tools. I think that's a huge part of, of where the disconnect is. And if we can cross over uh, that kind of that hump and, and really embrace the developer tools, and put our security capabilities in those tools. I think we can realize some really interesting uh, benefits from a security perspective. But again, even organizations aren't who say they're DevOps aren't fully DevOps either. So you know, there, there's there's definitely some nuances here. Yeah, definitely nuances and definitely, but but great opportunity to grow into it. So you know, um, Tanya was mentioning, you know. Azure has security scanning capabilities, let alone fuzzing capabilities. Um, Google, when they had, what was it, two or three months ago, um, they also announced bringing out of beta their own like web application scanner looking for cross-site scripting, just basic stuff like that. So putting that right in the hands of the developers. So it's basically flip a switch, and this is just, you know, pr basically within your IDE, here's just another little checkbox that says, and it actually, to a little bit better confidence here, add security. And I don't mean that kind of dismissively of checkbox security, but it is that easy to like work within where the developers are and developers responsibility. It's not like they have to pull in some particular application scanning expert who knows how to run and tweak this particular type of type of SAS scanner or, or DAS scanner. It just can happen because it's available. But by the same token, you know, that actually has to be enabled. People actually have to pay attention to it. Plus, it's not gonna solve everything. So I'll be the very first, for as much as I love those DAS and web app scanners, I'll be the first one to admit there's quite a large gap between what that automation can do and what humans need to do. And I think that is also that part about, if we try, you know, we say shift left is pretty easy shorthand, but 
where is our attention being focused from a security perspective? And not even just having those tools available, but having those conversations around threat models, sort of like, what are you building? And let's not worry so much about the programming language or the particular components or how this microservice talks to this other one and has you know, mutual cryptographic identification. It's more of like, what's the data going back and forth here? What are those workflows? What's that business logic and things that can go wrong? And I think that's also one of those aspects about training is that InfoSec community has talked about training for ages and ages and ages. And I'm still a bit skeptical about what training really sticks versus just like, here is something that is, you know, a couple slides presented and then walked away that doesn't, hasn't obviously really fixed anything if we're still dealing with cross-site scripting, you know, 20 plus years later. Yeah. Well, that's why I like Tanya's concept of that feedback loop, right? Yeah. You're doing this, but maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe, you know, <laughs> if you had those feedback loop mechanisms, that's a better way to learn because you're like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have done that, right? I should have used a service account over here. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done this or that it, from a configuration standpoint. That I think helps people learn better than maybe some of these other ways we've we've tried to train people in the past, especially the developers, right? Because they've got a lot of other things they're doing. Uh, Security is just another component of that. Yeah, and she was saying that was what was really cool is like, you know, as your the the Microsoft team is posting, here's what we learned about DevOps. Here's what went well, here's what went bad. And we're starting to see like that trend from some really big players. So, and I think it's great because it's that idea of that no one is so big that they can do no wrong or just because they're big or because you recognize their name, they must have, you know, their everything is perfect there. Um, and that kind of ties into that Google outage that happened um, over last uh, weekend. Um, and Google now just posted their postmortem about it. So talk about being pretty transparent and pretty open on something that technically wasn't security related, but still had a DevOps impact. And he, so here is that feedback loop you were just talking about, Map, is um, saying when they come out and said, guess what? I'm going to quote here, two normally benign misconfigurations and a specific software bug combined to initiate the outage. So that's just a great opening for something mm -hmm. that is like, you know, four hours of downtime where, you know, not only were it was a ton of Google services taken down, but Snapchat and, um, you know, a bunch of other services like People's Nest. And they were saying either I can't turn on my AC and it's pretty warm right now, or I can't even get into my door. So here's the other highlight of that. You know, there is a bit of brittleness in our Internet of Things uh, environment right now. Yeah. And it, what I thought was the most interesting out of this. Yeah, OK, there's a bug. But this is where configuration, I think, is the one thing that that uh, we don't pay enough attention to in the cloud is a misconfiguration that can bring yeah. down entire services, right? We, we always kind of tend to focus on the vulnerabilities, but there are a number of configurations for each of these services. And if you don't understand what those configurations are doing or how they interact, it can create issues like this, like, it's, like they said two benign misconfigurations. But when linked together with a bug, it brings an entire service down for four hours. And so I don't think we spend enough time on, on our cloud service configurations, which I think is gonna be an important thing for us to continue to focus on in the industry and correlate that in with the other aspects of security flaws and vulnerabilities because they, they are interlinked and when they come together in, in a very bad way, these are the types of things that happen. Yep. And I would also throw into that hat, um, in addition to misconfigurations, uh, that that overly scoped permissions. So that idea of identity, whether it's humans or service accounts, that we talked about that with Tanya as well, that um, I'm even though at the very beginning of this new segment, I mentioned that RDP vuln. So here's something that's going to be great warmification of the internet for whatnot, but I'm still going to bet you that the pen, the good pen testers out there, the good red teams out there, all they really want is to find that one set of credentials and that's your best backdoor. That's your best zero day, haha, -ha, into any network, especially cloud environments, because wow, they can get pretty complicated with, you know, RBAC is a great concept, 
But once you start to try to understand all the permission models and how granular it is, you can get so confused. You can just make some accidents happen. They're like, oh, well, I added this permission to make the service work because it wasn't working before, but it just so happens that was probably way more permission than a service needs. And so now you've, without realizing it, exposed more, you know, much more data than you would expect it to. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I was going to end, um, and real quick, this is episode 64. So a nice, great power of two. And um, of course, made me think of my old Commodore 64 and uh, learning basic was my first programming language. So I don't know um, if you you were playing around with Commodore or what what your first uh, computer was, Matt. My first computer was a Commodore 128. So we have to wait nice. uh, a little okay. while before we get to episode 128. But yeah, kind of the same thing. Oh, uh, Commodore 128, basic programming, then Pascal and a few other languages along the way, including C and C++, <laughs> which I haven't touched in, uh, let's see, 96. So it's been a while since I've, I've played with any uh, real code. But yeah, yeah, me too. The uh, that web app scanner that we alluded to, C plus plus, and I absolutely loved it. But um, definitely a bit dusty now. But um, even so, you know, I still remember because the Commodore came out in uh, August 1982, so that's 37 years ago. But um, also remember that fondly. But um, I think what we'll do is we're going to invite all of our listeners to stick around for at least another 64 episodes so we can get to episode 128, because that would be pretty awesome. And we'll go even beyond there. So uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we're going to see you next week on Application Security Weekly. 